Hello everyone. Thank you for stopping in again today as we start on our adventure of restoring a Singer 301 or 301A. If this is interesting to you, just be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. That helps me know if this is interesting content and it will help you follow along a little bit easier. I thought today what we would do is give this machine a once over just like I would if I you know, was just bringing it home. Then I wanted to talk with you if you decide to follow along uh, about a few tools that you might want to find um, around your house or if there's something unique that you might want to run out and get before you get started. I just know when I first started working on machines, some days I would have to wait a couple days for something to come in the mail or, you know, for the next time I was going to run out and be able to pick up what I needed. And then I was sort of at a standstill and that was frustrating because it is really easy to get super uh, engrossed in a project like this. So earlier I um, talked about this 301 and I explained how the original foot pedal uh, that was given to me with the machine didn't have the right plug in. So I always keep my own on hand. It's just a electronic style pedal and cord that I found on Amazon and I think I invested $25 or something in it. It really wasn't that much and it it's awesome. Um, I actually probably prefer it over the button style foot pedals just because the control is so perfect and if I'm sewing slow for a long time, the uh, foot controller isn't going to get uh, hot underneath my foot. But anyway, so we are going to start by just turning it on, which I think you can see, but the light does work in this, which is always a, a plus. Um, the next thing that I will do is I would remove any needle. If you have a needle in a machine that you brought home, before you test out the motor, take the needle out. Uh, just in case something's um, off in the settings here, you don't want to strike the needle plate. Uh, you don't want to hit the bobbin case or anything like that that could damage the machine or maybe have a piece of a needle go flying at you. So I do recommend removing your needle. So what I'm going to do now is just press the foot pedal and I should get some motion from the motor on this machine only because the person I got it from had tested it out a little bit. So we'll see. I'm not pressing very hard. Now I'm gonna go to what should be like full speed ahead. And what I have is this is super slow. For a 301, they can sew, I think it's over 1,100 stitches per inch. I can't recall off the top of my head, but it should go really fast. And I'm pretty sure I know why this one isn't, but as we start taking it apart, we'll be able to confirm whether or not that's the case. So the next thing that I'm going to look at after I kind of test this out, it does start to get a little faster the longer it runs. It's probably pretty gunked up inside. But anyway, I am going to check the um, movement of the feed dogs. And that's just how easily this moves up and down because this is my feed stitch regulator. And when I'm moving it, I should be seeing the little feed dogs that are in here going back and forth. And they are. Um, now would be a good time for me to remove the foot, I think. And that's just unscrewing this little thumb screw here. And this is not the original thumb screw for this foot. I mean, it works, it holds the foot on, but actually I think this might go to a buttonholer. I could be wrong but it would make sense that it fits because you would attach the buttonholer, I think with this screw. 
So we'll set those aside. I may have an extra of the right kind of thumb screw for this. Okay, so next thing I might want to explore is underneath here. And I'm gonna turn the machine so you can see. So one of the awesome things about a 301, and for me personally, uh, if I wasn't interested in having a small portable featherweight, which I would argue this is portable too, because the handle's amazing, and the featherweight doesn't have a handle on top of the machine. But the other thing that kind of sells me on a 301 is that I can adjust the feed dogs by turning this little knob here. Um, let me make sure that you can see that. So here, this little knob will rotate clockwise and counterclockwise. And when you turn it clockwise, it raises the feed dogs up. And when you turn it counterclockwise, it should lower them. Now I've had machines where initially this was pretty frozen, but there is a little um, line in here for a larger flathead screwdriver that you can work it in there to kind of get it initially started because after sitting for a lot of years and maybe a buildup of grease, don't be surprised if this doesn't turn freely with your fingers, but when you're done, it will. Uh, okay, so the next thing you might want to do, we know that the needle bar is moving on this and we don't thankfully have anything that's frozen, but if you uh, did bring a machine home and you couldn't even turn the hand wheel, there's a couple things I would have you do. First, I would have you open up the nose of the machine. So inside the nose, you have your needle bar, your presser foot system here, the bar and the spring, um, and you have your thread take up. And any one of these could be locked up uh, and make it hard, well, actually not this, the needle bar and the t thread take up could be locked up and that's why your machine's not turning. So if you feel like the hand wheel doesn't turn easily, stick a couple drops of oil right here and let it kind of work its way in. And then from the top, when we take the top off, I'll show you where you can oil these parts to let them get a little bit of, uh, right here, a little bit of lubrication as well. Next thing I would look at while I'm in the process of figuring out why doesn't the hand wheel turn, um, and this will introduce the first tool, you're gonna need a number of flathead screwdrivers. I'm just, I try to be really careful. I love ones that have a magnetic tip that really helps um, hold on to the screws, especially the smaller screws. But with any screwdriver, be careful when you're working around all of this paint because you slip out, you could slide and, and you know chip the edges or something like that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the two top screws on the top. And we're gonna check out what's going on inside this machine. So once you take this off, there's no need to put it back on. Just remember, this is the top of your machine and keep the top together with the screws. So I always kind of like lay the screws inside and set it aside until I'm ready to clean it up. Um, I will point out that I will show you how to remove the handle because that actually gets really gunked up and greasy and we'll take the handle off. It makes it easier to polish this top. So we'll talk about how to do that as well. But for now, um, the only thing we'll remove off of this is the handle. And in this case, um, I don't know if you can see through those holes. You can actually see daylight through these holes right here. So these first three should have a uh, oil wick in them and this machine doesn't, someone took them out. So I prefer to replace them. I guess you really wouldn't have to if you didn't want to, but um, the oil would still go where it needs to go. But I, just because it originally came with oil wicks, I will put new ones back in. 
So um, screws and top. And this is really important when you start taking apart a machine to remember what goes where. And that means develop a system that works for you. I'm always working on a towel and that's, <laughs> It's because these machines are dirty, but also you're going to be flipping it and turning it. And I just like a softer surface to protect the paint. So I don't really worry about laying it on its back or flipping it up on its end when I'm putting parts on here. Sometimes that's just an easier position. Um, I'm going to go ahead and unplug this stuff too now. We don't need electricity at this point. So um, what I re did the very first time is I had a huge piece of paper. I don't even know. I think it was like a roll of packing paper or something. And I spread it out and covered my whole table. And this is actually, I work off of a, um, a cutting table because I sew. So this thing was handy and it spreads up to like, it's 36 inches wide and I think six feet long. So I can open it up as long as I want. But anyway... I actually laid the parts down in places on the table on top of the paper and I wrote, would draw a circle and write what the parts were and you know keep them inside that circle. But that didn't really work out too well because screws tend to roll and things like that. So then what I started to do was I just grabbed some inexpensive sandwich bags. And what I would do is, as I take the parts off, I would put them in the bag. So if I'm worried about losing these two screws that go with the light cover, I would put them in the bag uh, and I would take a little piece of paper and stick it inside that said what the parts went to. So in this case, it would say cover screws. And you don't have to get the technical name on every paper. You need to write down a name that you're going to remember that's going to make sense to you. Um, so anyway, all the parts basically still to this day come off and go in a sandwich bag. I just don't have to label them anymore. I've worked with them enough times. I know what goes where just by looking at it. So I still wouldn't ever just throw all the parts into a bucket. Uh, I think I'll keep separating them out with bags. So I feel like that's what has been the easiest way for me to work. Uh, and you will find a way for yourself that you keep parts separate. But uh, it's really, they most of the parts all need to come off first. So it's not like you can remove something and put it back on and then go start on something else it will be really hard to clean up your machine and troubleshoot that way. So now that I have the top of the machine off, I want to take a look inside and I'm going to do my best to not have a wiggly jiggly camera, but I want you to see what one clue I have kind of staring me in the face is as far as how, why this machine isn't running so quick or so fast. Uh, is really right in the top of the machine. So if we look here, uh, let's really focus in on this. So here we have the um, metal gear and it actually meets up with another metal gear underneath it that um, has to be greased. Uh, it's This one I think is over, <laughs> it's over greased, which wouldn't, really hurt too much except for some of that grease in there is probably really old and isn't really the kind of grease you would want in your machine and what I'm noticing is is when I turn this hand wheel I actually feel a little bit of resistance at one point which could mean that along oh it's right there I can feel it along with all this old extra grease there could be um little particles of something, who knows what, that's actually wedged in the teeth of those gears. So one of the things that we will do taking this apart is we will learn how to clean these gears and then of course re-grease them. This section here, um, I actually see grease shoved down in this and guess what guys, this isn't supposed to get grease, this is only supposed to get sewing machine oil. So hopefully you don't see that in your machine, but if you do, 
I'll show you how to get it cleaned up. Uh, next over here is where I'm going to look. And here, I mean, because of all the grease, it's really makes it hard to tell what is going on. But this, um, you can see a, a gear spinning right in here. That's actually part of the hand wheel and it runs up against this uh, metal worm gear. And there's just way too much grease on it. And once we clean that up, that could alone, just by getting all that old gunky, sticky grease off, um, it could make a world of difference on how fast our motor spins. I'm not going to bet money that that's why this machine is going slow, but I would say it could be a contributing factor. So let me see if I can set this back down. Oh, and just another quick peek in here. So really what's left is your other moving parts and these will just clean. We won't take any of this out, so don't get too nervous. Uh, we will take the wiring out here, which this little thing snaps off real easy, and uh, we'll get the wiring and the motor out. But the rest of this will just clean, and then we're going to add fresh oil. So I told you I would tell you how to oil the parts, like in the thread take up. And if you look, okay, look at that. Um, so here is the thread take up system. See this little hole right here? That needs a little drop of oil. And if you continue to look down, uh, let's see, here we go. There's another hole. That needs a drop of oil, okay? That's um, gonna keep this spinning freely. And then, let me see if I can show you the other. I would also stick a little bit of oil right where this uh, piece of like, cast iron looking metal hits up against where it goes into the needle bar that that could use a little bit of oil too as long as you're oiling especially if it feels like it's frozen and you can't turn the hand wheel those are the the places i would hit first and then sadly you just have to wait for the oil to work okay so we have the top off we've looked it over um We've discovered how much grease we have up in the top of the machine that needs to be cleaned out. I'm going to take my um, standard foot and thumb screw. That isn't really the right thumb screw. Go ahead and put it in a bag. And now you can, since you have the top off, this is going to be flopping around a lot. So just go ahead and gently lift up and pull back. And the end of the nose plate is going to come off in your hand. And if you're having issues with this or it's not staying on the machine properly, I would like you to look. You'll see there's a little pin here and there's a little pin here and they fit into holes in the back of the machine. So when you put this back on, you're just gonna line up these little pins with the holes in the back and it will just kind of seat itself and then it should open and close. But um, I go ahead and set this aside now, and then later I will show you how to remove this little part and this little part for cleaning, which honestly, it just makes it so much easier to not have this little piece sticking out here when you go to finally polish up the body of the machine. So I don't think this really needs a label, um, and I'm not going to beg that. I'm just going to set it aside. Now, this is why I'm using a towel because I am gonna lay the machine on its back and I don't want to scratch it. I mean, this is in great shape for the most part, so why add any extra damage? So when you turn the machine on its back, you're going to see, um, hopefully, a cover on the bottom. If you're not sure where your serial number was for your machine, it's right there. So here is a little screw that you just are gonna turn counterclockwise to the left and you may have a little felt here that's great if you do um, if you don't you might want to think about finding some felts online because it keeps um, vibrations happening so this is screwed in if this vibrates you get a, a weird noise so the felt would keep that from making noise while you're sewing but anyway set this aside and here's what the inside looks like. Let's see if I can get the light a little bit better. 
Oh, that might be a little bit better. Okay, so <laughs> look at the, can you see that glob of grease right there? Ugh, it's so gross. But this needs to come out. So this is a um, like an industrial type felt drip pad that would have come in all of the bottoms of these 301s. And um, what I do is I actually buy my uh, industrial felt in like yardage and then I just I cut out a new drip pad because I struggle finding replacements or sometimes I just feel like I'm doing enough of these machines where I don't want to spend you know eight or nine dollars for every replacement so I bought a yard or two of the felt and I just cut it when I need it and it's just more economical for me uh, and then I know it's the right type of felt as well so this is your bottom cover. It's not gonna go back on for a long time. Um, when we're all done, it'll go back. So I'm just gonna set it aside and I'll set this. <laughs> There's, this is the only piece on the machine that looks like this. I know where it goes. I'm not gonna forget. I'm just gonna set it aside. Okay, so now what you're going to be looking at is these gears right here and they are just like the other ones extremely gunked up and greasy um honestly i don't know what kind of grease this is when i show you the kind of grease i would recommend using uh it's not that color it's like a very light yellow. So some other parts that uh, if your machine is frozen that you might wanna add a little oil would be anywhere where metal's moving on metal. And if you can't turn the hand wheel, it's gonna be hard for you to tell where. So let me see if I can give it a couple turns so you can see parts moving. So we have movement here. So add some oil right here, add some oil here. Here's a good place for oil, and there's even a little hole where you can put oil. Do not put oil on the gears. It's not supposed to go on the gears. So I promised you that I would kind of give you an idea of the tools that you need. And um, screwdrivers, flathead screwdrivers, preferably with a magnetic tip to hold on to your screws. And you will go with... Um, it's very big size so when we're taking out parts of the feed stitch regulator and the bobbin winder i find myself reaching for this heavy duty screwdriver but then i all the way i'll go all the way down to something very small when i'm working with the hook and taking the hook apart there are some teeny tiny screws and you actually will use something this little uh, Specialty wise, I do have uh, one other screwdriver that, here it is. Um, this works really well when you're working in the uh, feed dog area because you don't have a lot of clearance. And I actually found this on Amazon. There's a bunch of different makers. They come with several different bits, a lot of them. You're gonna need the flathead ones. Uh, there are no Phillips head screwdrivers that are used on a machine. Um, there are some other things that I use tool wise. Uh, if we have to adjust the feed dog height, we're going to need uh, a little wrench that I think it's 9 that this fits. Nope, I'm sorry, it's not, it's smaller than that. I'll have to get back to you on the size, but you will need something, a, a wrench that will fit onto this little screw right here. That is really gross. Um, so as far as products that you're going to need, I'll try not to take too long to talk about this, but grease. And I love So Retro Grease. It is made uh, for vintage and antique sewing machines. It is for the motor and gear uh, gears on the machine. And so see this little spot right here, um, I don't know if you can see it, but down here there's a little silver thing. We're going to be putting grease in this little tube before it's all said and done. Plus we're gonna be greasing the gears with this. And I just know that it's a reliable grease. I find it at the Singer Featherweight shop. 
What else is really cool is that it comes in this tube, uh, which just makes it super easy to get in where you need to on the gears and apply the grease. Uh, and it lasts a long time. I think I've done probably 10 machines with this tube and I still have plenty left. So I do like the So Retro brand and I think they make an oil too now, which will be totally fine. Or you can just stick with Singer brand oil. That's fine too. Um, sometimes I find this little tip is a little difficult to work with getting where I want to go. So for me, I bought some handy little droppers and when I want to oil down in a little corner somewhere, I just find this works for me. But also you could put oil on a paintbrush and get oil where you need it to go. So have a few of these on hand. They're very inexpensive. I use one for applying oil. I use one to help me work the geese, uh, uh, grease sorry, into the gears. And then I use one when I'm just like touching up parts for rust, if I have anything that has rust on it. And this is a great rust remover. There's probably many kinds out there. It's just the kind that I bought. So um, you are going to also need some alcohol, rubbing alcohol, and we'll talk about it as we get started where alcohol can go on a machine, especially a black machine. You don't want alcohol on a black machine's paint. Um, next, uh, you are going to want to think about how you're going to clean your machine. I use the Zymol products. So this is the uh, pre-wax cleaner. This is the only thing I'll clean my black feather weights with because it doesn't damage the lacquer. And um, since I, with a tan feather weight, I could get cleaners on this and not worry about messing up the paint. But um, with a black one, I can't. When I clean a black machine, it's very different than cleaning a tan machine. And this is pretty much the only way I can get the outside of the machine clean. Uh, this is not inexpensive, but it lasts me a long time so far. Uh, and I purchased it sort of in a pack. It comes with their uh, Carnuba wax as well. So I use them together. But I think the Singer Featherweight Shop has their own mixture now with the So Retro label where you can get a little bit of cleaner and a little bit of the Carnuba wax and it's their own formula. I actually do have it, but I just haven't opened it yet because I will wait until I use up all my Zymol before I switch. So if anyone has tried both and they have a preference over, you know, which works best, I'd love to hear back from you. Um, the other thing that you would need, I don't have it handy, is crud cutter. Uh, you can get a spray bottle of crud cutter. If you're just doing one machine, that's more than enough. I buy it by the gallon because I do a lot more than one machine. Um, last thing that you might want, uh, this is what I use when I start to clean certain parts of the motor. It's an electronic cleaner. It dries super fast and uh, it really does a great job at cleaning the wire coils inside the motor. I, I just use it outside. So I think that's pretty much it for if you're if you just need a list of okay what do I need you need sandwich bags and screwdrivers and sewing machine oil you will need grease not right away but you will need it and then you'll need the products to clean your machine so I think for the next video we'll start removing parts like the uh, bed extension and I say that because um, when you're working, you're going to be grabbing the machine, moving it around, and it's really easy to, especially once you've taken the top off, it's really easy to grab the bed extension and you just don't want to do that. So best practice is to take it off and get it out of the way. So we'll go over how to remove that and we'll go over how to remove the hand wheel and then we'll go from there. And I, I really do think the, the way I'd like to do the series is step-by-step step taking it apart 
and then step by step putting it back together. So if you are doing a machine, if you're restoring machine yourself, you'll be able to follow along from the first video all the way to the end of the series instead of having to um, watch a video on how to take out the thread take up lever and um, then go back and find that video later when you want to learn how to put it back in, if that makes sense. So thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you will uh, follow along with me and leave me any questions or comments you have below and we'll see you real soon. Bye.